I'm Matt. I'm Brennan. And this is Bourbon at the Bench. All right, so today we are talking about saxophones. Okay. So we're talking about buying saxophones. Yeah, buying saxophones, shopping for a saxophone. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I spent a lot of time on the retail side when I was working in Michigan. Um, And, you know, we always had so many saxophones in stock. New, used, major name brand, not so name brand. You know, so people would come in. A lot of times people knew exactly what they wanted because they have a private teacher or a band director or even a prospective professor. um, And they knew exactly what they wanted. I need a Selmer series two with the gold plated neck or something. And then there were others that were like, my son's private teacher said he needs a new saxophone. That's it. And you know, they're upgrading from a a Bundy two that's been in a marching band for 1000 years. So, you know, Almost anything is an improvement. Um, So I've had the discussion a lot with a lot of parents, a lot of students, you know, there's a lot to consider for sure. Yeah, um, I agree. I, (laughs) maybe we can talk about some different paths one may take Mm -hmm. in purchasing a saxophone, new versus used, vintage versus modern perhaps yeah yeah even shopping for vintage in general might be handy and then perhaps things to look for things to avoid yeah and like you know there's so many places to buy a used saxophone in the year 2020 and what do you do do you just buy it off of facebook marketplace off of some random person and assume that it's good i mean there's so many variables to talk about for sure okay let's start with in general new versus used okay i mean what do you have to say about that sure well this is this is tricky too i think it is i have this conversation with people a lot actually um personally and a lot of this has to do with me being a repair person then. But sure. personally, I probably would not buy a brand new saxophone for myself because if, you know, I know what to look for. I can fix it and whatever. Sure. Um, I, I can see some pros of buying a brand new horn being it's brand new. No one else has ever used it. So all yours, it's like, again, like a brand new car or something. Um, Another pro could be, you know, it's a newer model or it has upgraded features from the factory. Sure. Yeah. And and that's a thing. I I, I mean, I guess if cosmetics are a huge issue for you, (laughs) it would again be brand new sparkly, no scratches or anything. Um, And maybe also just having the luxury of choice, you know, choosing exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. You don't have to search high and low to find what you want. Right. You know, it's easy to find, okay, I want silver plated, this model, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you don't, yeah. What if you, if you have those kind of um, decisions made, then that's it. And you're not necessarily going to get to try a bunch or, you know, you're going to find one that's in stock. I think uh, when people are, you know, buy a brand new instrument, they're just like, I want it to be brand new. Yeah. That's all they, they care about. Especially like a parent upgrading their students equipment. Yeah. Like, I want them to have a brand new one. I don't, I don't want it to be used. I don't yeah, they it. see used as secondhand and lesser quality. Yeah, or dirty, or you know. That's yeah, and, and they—it's it, not—they're not wrong, mm. but 
um, you know, also a good used instrument can be fixed up to be, to play and be even better than me. So right. the thing that's nice about brand new is you can go to a store, not, there aren't many left, it seems, but there are a few around the country that you, you know, if you want a new Yamaha or you want a new Selmer, I mean, those are the two super main brands. Um, you can typically find a place that has a few of each model in stock and you can play a couple of them and decide which one you like the most because we know that there are a lot of differences from one to the other. Yeah. But when you're talking about used instruments, um, you know, you might, you might find a place that has a couple used Selmer series twos or threes or something in stock. Um, but the the process is definitely it's just going to be different. There aren't going to it's you're not going to have the same array of choices. Yeah, that's that's totally true. I mean, if you think about, we'll take Selmer for example. If someone wants a brand new one, they have the option to go to Elkhart. Right. They will pull out as many as they have. Yep. You can try them all, right, and choose the one that you that suits you best. Right. So, I mean, I guess I see, you know, the perks of getting brand new, but for me, that's probably not something that I would do. Well, you can save a good chunk of money buying used. And when you do, it doesn't depreciate nearly as much as it would if you bought it brand new. Right. I mean, there's pros and cons just like anything else, I guess. Absolutely. I think I think big takeaways are um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with used. There are plenty of times where it could be better than new, especially if it's had good work done to it first. And that name brands are important for a number of reasons, with the simplest being uh, retention of value. What do you have to say about the off brands? The really cheap, I'm sure, we don't have to name any specifically, but I'm sure you've had parents of students say, well, I could just get this one on Amazon or samsclub.com. You get what you pay for. <laughs> and in my opinion, if, if, if you were battling, should I buy this super inexpensive horn or rent one, I would rent one. Yeah. You may, you know, you never know. Uh, a student may take off and keep going for years and you end up buying it outright and everything. Usually when you rent a horn, it's it comes with some kind of service contract. Yep. So you have maintenance included. Um, also, typically the brands that are rented out um, are actually serviceable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, even, I mean, it depends where you go. Yeah, uh, like the huge chain music store is probably going to do things differently than the smaller specialty place. But in general, um, they're going to rent instruments that they believe to be worthwhile and at least repairable. Yeah, and I know from working at one of those major yeah. chains, they, they have a list of brands that they do service. Mm -hmm. It's not on that list. They don't service it. Right. And the biggest aspect from what I understood was the parts availability. So sure. um, a lot of these sort of lesser known or really inexpensive brands that you see, that they're not distributing parts. And that's a major issue if something gets messed up, right? even as small as like a screw right so, the thread pitch on any given screw could be different um and i mean i it is certainly possible to repair anything yeah but what what ends up happening is if you don't have parts readily available and we're talking about parts like screws and things made out of metal corks yeah. and felts and pads obviously we can we can make that work on any instrument. Um, but the parts, if something breaks, um, where it might be $10 to buy the new part and replace it, 
if it doesn't exist to be bought, you can certainly fabricate it from scratch, but that takes a lot of time and time costs money. And you so quickly start to encroach upon the original price of the instrument during its first repair if something goes wrong. Right. So then your repair exceeds the value. Yeah. Just like, why, why is this a thing? And, <laughs> and like one of, the, one of the biggest issues I have with some of these, I don't know, I guess we'll just call them off brands, is the quality of the metal is usually just inferior to the name brands. And, and what that means to the performer or to the student or the parent is the, the metal moves under your fingers from normal use. Keys start bending, adjustments start shifting. Um, and, then, and then you're not even talking about replacing parts or pads or anything. It's just bending keys back to their correct position so that the horn works. So maybe we can talk about buying a vintage saxophone. I think this is really tricky, actually. Because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of factors. I mean, it, sometimes, like in the case of this busher right here, this instrument's like 80, 90 years old now. How do you, you don't know its life and its history and right. what, you know, what do you look for and that sort of thing. If it were me, I would probably want to go through like a very, reputable dealer or you know slash repair shop person um because they're generally gonna have horns in their inventory that are top notch they they know what's been done and everything and they can fix it <laughs> yeah i think half the battle is is you can you, it's not hard to find a vintage instrument to buy it's hard to find a vintage instrument that is in perfect playing condition when you're buying it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I personally wouldn't even worry about that as much. Mm -hmm. From a player's perspective, I could see that. But also, I think it's important to know from a player's perspective, if you're going the vintage route, you better keep in mind you're gonna want to take it to someone unless you buy it from, like I was saying, shops with, you know, large inventory of vintage stuff. They most of the time, as far as I know, they go through every horn at some point. Right. Um, at least you hope so. Yeah, and at least you know they've looked at it and probably given it a quick play test. Right. Um, but if you go, you know, on eBay or something, just, I would say, expect to get it looked at and worked on and possibly a significant amount of work. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's safer to assume it needs all the work done and then be pleasantly surprised if it doesn't need a complete overhaul, <laughs> repad, yes. mechanical restoration. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I, I feel like from a player's perspective, it can be tricky because oftentimes you can't play it first. And yeah. now if you're, if you're somebody who's played a bunch of specific Khan or Bisher saxophones and you know that you like this specific model, then, you know, that's one thing. But if you don't have that experience, it can be tricky because you don't, you don't really know what you're going to get if it needs if it needs a restoration before it's in fantastic shape. It can be tricky. Yeah, there are some more obvious ones, um, but one of the things that's most important to me, and I think a lot of people overlook, is what quality, what kind of quality, what kind of condition are the pads in, and that's a really hard thing for just anybody to look at um because you know you, you get a horn sometimes we're like yeah it has pads they're all there they're not ripped um 
you know, so that's great. But, but, you know, you or I look at it and see these are old, they're hard, they're dry. The leather is just, it's life is gone. They're not ripped. There's no felt showing. It's not, they're not missing. Um, but you see pads like that. And then you know that the, that the adhesive behind them is also shot. And it, you know, it, it becomes, to, it comes to a point where those, those pads are unadjustable and they're likely absorbing water because, because of their age. And that's something that I don't know how you could, how you could tell people to even like try and feel, try and get your finger and see if it's soft, supple, not, not crunchy and dry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that's a tricky one. I feel like that's one of the harder things to, to look at. Yeah. I, I mean, do you think in that specific situation where the pads are dried out, just the instrument's older anyway, generally? So, you know, if, you're, if you know you're looking at an older instrument, you've got to keep in mind, this is probably going to need some major work. Yeah, but it, it's not even necessarily like vintage old, but like no, no, but like an original series two. Oh yeah, I mean those are old now. Yeah, I guess so. But oh. those especially, they can look perfect, and like the pads look to be in great shape, um, but they're essentially unadjustable. And if they're leaking, there's no, there's nothing you can do about it besides replace them. Anyway, so besides besides looking at the quality of the pads, corks, felts. Um, what other kind of things do you look for? Well, I guess it, if you can see this stuff, and it, I know it can be difficult if you're not used to it, but it, if you can see that there's any been any major damage to the body of the instrument, I think that's something to look for. You know, I um, if it's been repaired well, it's going to be harder to see. Right. And that's not a bad thing. But if, if you can see like, like a ripple in the body or the bow or something. Yeah, the way the light hits the brass tube is, is the giveaway. I mean, along those same lines, like a severely bent key or mechanism or something. Um, and again, these things can be fixed. Right. Uh, but it's something to, I, I think it's something specifically to consider when you're looking at the price tag. If it's priced really close to a new instrument, for example, and you start noticing these things, the price needs to change. It doesn't mean that the instrument's not worthy. Um, I think, I think another, another easier thing to spot is things that have been soldered, which again, isn't bad, but if you can see, cause you know, an, uh, uh, a saxophone is largely brass colored, yellow, gold colored, unless it's silver plated. But typically when you, when you look at where things are soldered together, where parts are connected, if you see, uh, you know, burnt lacquer, missing lacquer, tarnished brass where everything else is shiny, um, or just like gray blobs of literal solder, um, that's a sign that there's been damage and that's something that can be repaired pretty close to invisibly depending on what or where it is um but that's something to look out for for sure yeah I, and i guess it, it can be tricky to to see or tell what might be bad or to avoid but um that's if if someone sends me a listing and they're thinking about buying it those are some of the things i look for just sort of through the pictures real yeah quick. yeah absolutely i always i always zoom um, in real far yeah pads body damage soldering uh if the neck's pulled down or damaged severely those types of things um but like we've been getting at this whole time if I feel strongly about this, if it's one of these we know top 
tier brands, high quality brands, then it is fixable. Yeah. Um, even if it's missing a part, the parts are generally available. Um, obviously, if it's vintage, that's going to be a little bit harder to overcome, but, um, you know, it can be fabricated if it needs to. But um, again, they're, they're worth it because they're holding their value. Exactly. Versus buying something that was a few hundred bucks to begin with. It's just, it's just not worth it in my opinion. Yep. You could spend that money on so many other things. Good bourbon. Yeah, like good bourbon and. Hey Matt, what you drinking? Water. Okay. Can I be in the tuxedo this time? Fine. Buffalo Trace, huh? Yeah, have you had this before? I'm sure I have, but I can't remember it specifically. Honestly, it's really not that bad after that initial sort of taste. And it's also, I was looking it up because it was a gift, but mm. um, it's actually pretty reasonable. It's like 30 something a bottle, so. Yeah, this is Noble Oak, Double Oak Bourbon from, um, Bottled by Noble Oak Spirits Company, Newtown, Ohio. And it is bourbon whiskey finished with sherry oak staves. Oh. And I really, I honestly, I picked this one because it had a lot of like information on it. You know, some of them are like, oh, I wonder what this is about. You turn it over and it says government warning. And yeah. like, that's it. Um, most of a bourbon's character comes from the wood and with noble oak, we elegantly marry two of the world's most coveted cask types. First, time-honored methods are used to rest noble oak in charred new American white oak barrels, which I don't know. New is probably not as good as like old, pre-aged, you know. But then through their proprietary finishing process, proprietary, they add complexity using Spanish sherry oak staves, same wood used to craft the world's finest and rarest single malts. Oh. The result is a totally unique flavor that is elegantly balanced and bold. Notes of dried fruit, cherry, vanilla, and spice pervade. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. Next time, we are going to do an entire episode just tone holes. I was yeah. like, oh, I, have a, I have a whiskey and coke. Me, 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 me. <laughs> hey, Matt. Do you know a very good place to buy some tone hole lifters? <laughs> I'm Matt. I'm Brennan. And this is... <laughs> No. <laughs>